Thanks, everyone. Um, break it up a bit. A quick show of hands. Who here works for an international organization, company, charity, impact fund? Good. Well, you might not know it, but just by existing every year, you generate thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pounds of profits for banks. Just doing what you always do. GoodFX is a B Corp that works with established payment companies to capture those banking products and then divert the profits and then divert them to the charities of our clients choosing and support the refugee. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. I'm not close enough to the mic. <laughs> and support the refugee work we do. The ask from me after this is go and find your CFO and say there's an actionable way to do what you always do but we can fund these projects at no extra cost. It supports our work with refugees. It's the missing link for employment that we've talked about. These are pragmatic, scalable solutions. And Nova, our head of sales training, is going to talk to you about that now. Thank you. It's much closer for me. <laughs> I'm only five foot. Um, so I'm Nova, I am the head of training at GoodFX. Uh, and we, as well as the core business model, we use our business to empower economic inclusion through training for refugees. Today, I'm here to tell you about how our programs are designed to fill a gap in the market of refugee training, at the same time as you raising the bar for refugee employment opportunity. Uh, to tell you about our current projects and to tell you how you can help. The UNHCR's recent report, Improving Digital Livelihood Opportunities for Refugees, highlights an ex that many of the existing programs focus on digital freelancing skills. It's a, valuable, it's a valuable way to train refugees, but often these projects lack consistency for the people they train. Um, freelancing can be sporadic, competitive, and lacking in job security. This is where GoodFX sees a gap in the market. Now, sales and finance are often seen as the big bads of the corporate world, um, but as jobs that are always in demand, well paid, and realistically in need of diversity, um, they present opportunities that are unrivaled in, in, I'm so sorry, <laughs> I'm just going to have to read, uh, in other careers. I can personally attest to this, having come from a working class background and into a tech sales career that catapulted me into the highest tax bracket in my mid-twenties. And dare I say it with very minimal skills going in. <laughs> At GoodFX, we think this presents an opportunity for refugees. Sales skills are easy to teach and very possible to prove. That's why we've designed a 10-week course delivered remotely into refugee communities, which breaks down a professional sales process into bite-sized and easy to implement steps. This is rolled out in twice-weekly sessions over Zoom, where attendees are supported to understand how to do professional sales and given the opportunity to use their skills on the GoodFX brand, actively engaging with businesses on our behalf and, of course, earning commission when they're successful. For our learners, this creates an internship-like experience, blending practical sales training with foundational financial market education provided by Finance Unlocked. This approach not only equips our learners with essential skills, but also enhances their employability, enabling them to showcase real-world experience on their CVs. The primary outcome of our program, therefore, is to equip trainees for business development roles, either locally, supporting the local economy, or remotely. But also, it means that we can enable them to grow their own freelance customer base if they want to. We also use the programs to identify talent for GoodFX's own remote sales team. To date, we've trained two training cohorts and are currently embarking on a phase of research to launch a cohort specifically to encourage more refugee women into sales in Kenya. I know there's a few people talked about that, so I'd really love your input if you've got any. Our future focus is to continue to expand with the ambition of empowering refugee communities worldwide to foster local economic growth and use the GoodFX business model to funnel resources into the local economy rather than established financial centers. To enable this, we are currently looking for funding which will support the deployment of more training cohorts. This funding means that we can partner with local hubs, providing safe spaces for learning, connectivity, equipment, childcare, and furthering our mission to offer dignified, secure, and uh, employment through our sales and finance training programs. 
So, in closing, GoodFX is offering sales and finance training that is designed to open doors to meaningful, secure and dignified work through empathetic, practical and proven programmes. Supporting refugees with commercial trainings means both opening the doors to new, well-paid careers, but also creating sustainability for the current digital freelance community and local economies. So, to use what we call in training an alternative sales closing technique, would you like to fund one cohort or would you prefer to fund ten? Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, good to be here. So, my name is Matt Hopewell. Um, I'm Executive Director of Taraco Valley Foods. We're a refugee-focused agricultural social enterprise currently operating in a place called Rumwanja Refugee Settlement, which is in southwestern Uganda. Um, we are currently milling maize grain. It's the staple food of Uganda. We produce maize flour, which we sell, and we're proving that it's, um, it's possible to do scalable social enterprise in a rural refugee hosting community in Africa. Um, we're hoping to do this in order to encourage further investment into the infrastructure needed in the agricultural value chains in, um, in Uganda, but also to be sustainably um, creating funds to, um, to, to invest back into the producers as well as their consumers um, producing the locally important produce. So as mentioned earlier, Uganda hosts 1.5 million refugees, mostly from South Sudan and DR Congo. It's the, first, it's the, it's the largest refugee hosting uh, country in, in Africa. Um, now, what's often not known is that 75% of those refugees depend on farming as their primary source of employment. So it offers a chance for self-employment to um, a a sort of achieve food security, um, a sense of self-reliance. However, the, uh, the actual value chains themselves, as mentioned by the first um, speaker this morning, the agricultural value chains are very uh, often unjust and inefficient, selling prices for the producer in the global south, as, as well in the global north as well, is often very low. Um, in Uganda, in, in Rwanda, sorry, most maize producers earn only £30 per six-month season. Um, there's people that are taking advantage of refugee producers and their vulnerabilities, their poverty. Um, they, refugees have, a, you know, and, and other host community um, smallholders experience an urgency to sell soon after harvest in order to pay school fees and just address their basic needs. So people are taking advantage of that and the lack of resources for aggregation and value addition opportunities by smallholders themselves. Um, now, the traditional or the normative response has been to continue um, supporting humanitarian intervention. The plaster of humanitarian support in Uganda is failing. It's uh, falling off, revealing systemic wounds within these uh, dominant uh, agr agrarian economies on which people are depending. So, what we're doing at Taraco is to really be working outside of the humanitarian system and actually get inside very actively into those value chains on which people are depending on. So <clears throat> we're doing that through a, uh, a four-stage approach trying to create a more robust food system and a fairer economy. Um, so the four steps are one, to be investing into adding value to produce grown by local smallholders in these refugee hosting areas. So as I said, we started with maize, started with maize uh, selling maize flour. Um, we produce just 1.7 tonnes of flour a day. It doesn't sound, it sounds like a lot, but there's a lot more we could be doing there. We're soon to um, break even by doing this, um, by doubling our production. The mill itself employs uh, 19 people, seven of whom are from the Congo, uh, DR Congo. Um, <clears throat> now, being a running a mill and doing value addition gives us the opportunity to provide like a direct market access. We are an off-taker. We need stock to feed the mill. Um, so by doing that, it gives us a chance to offer better selling prices. We offer premium prices up to 18% uh, per kilo of grain that we buy. As long as it's a quality um, kilo, we have like a different grading level on that. Um, it incentivizes better, uh, better investment into the production, um, raising food standards. The second thing is to be actually supporting the supply chain. So offering training at a level of production, um, but especially post-harvest handling. A lot of NGOs focus on the production element, but not so much on the market linkage the, and the post-harvest handling of crop. 
So we do that and we see uh, yields increase between like 25 to 50% in turn. Um, and then we also do, we have, a, we have a 20 acre demonstration farm. So we do um, test uh, different crops, uh, regenerative growing practices, different types of seed, um, so that we can be promoting within the area and test other value added products and their market linkages. The result of which we see farmers able to earn 50 to 80% more um, income per season, um, depending on their time of, of sales. So that's equivalent to about 10 to 20 pounds additional per agricultural season. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it's like a great first step to help um, those producers move into other enterprises that aren't necessarily agricultural or into other like higher uh, agricultural value chains. Regarding our investment, as I mentioned, we're breaking even within the next six, six months. That's our projection. Um, but we need to move just a bit beyond just breaking even and therefore looking for investment to, well, you know, have more infrastructure, more mills, <laughs> um, more transportation. We also have to look at other value added products um, and move into other refugee hosting areas within Uganda, and maybe beyond, which would necessitate moving into other uh, value added food products. Um, so yeah, we really believe this is a quite a novel, um, very practical um, solution to um, very unjust agricultural economies, generating um, capital within the refugee settlement rather than wealth being extracted, which it so often is. Um, and yeah, we just uh, hope you would love to talk more about it later. And thank you very much. <laughs>
others around them. And this is huge, especially for children who may feel like they've lost agency. Um, you know, if, if they've faced violent or, or traumatic displacement and just faced bigger structural factors that they can't control. Um, one of, so the way that we measure impact for big partners is quite intentional. Uh, we have developed ways of um, measuring sort of impact on confidence and relationship skills and empathy. Um, and one of the most powerful uh, recent experiences actually was with uh, a little boy um, who was from Syria and uh, had this sort of protective layer of silence and hostility. He had never been to a formal school before. He came here um, unaccompanied. And um, in from the very first, and he had a language barrier. It was hard for him to communicate. And in the very first session with primary school children, he found two little girls in his um, group who were also from Syria, twins. And he just became this big brother uh, role model. And you could see him just open up and blossom. And it was this amazing transformation. And by the end of it, um, we were talking a lot more, too. <laughs> so um, in terms of... Um, in terms of funding, we are a mission-driven, not-for-profit organization, and our work would benefit greatly from, um, from grant and philanthropy funding. We can talk about the numbers later. Please come talk. And, um, but we are also looking to potentially partner with private schools and monetize some of the sessions because the skills we build are valuable for every child. Uh, we're also looking for new partnerships in the UK, so for service providers working with uh, refugee and asylum-seeking kids. Um, so we, we have proof of concept, we know what we do works, um, and like Mr. Klink, uh, we believe in the power of happy memories and positive experiences to build resilience uh, for children to cope with difficult circumstances. And we hope we've convinced you to invest in happiness too. Come talk to us. Hey, good morning, everyone. We all still here, all still awake, full of caffeine. Um, last but not least, you've got me. Apologies for that. Um, I'm going to make it short and sweet. Perez has already told me that there's something in my name label here that if I go over five minutes, I'm going to just spontaneously combust. So we're going to try and get through this. So bear with us, guys. Coffee Station will be coming soon. Um, thank you for having me. It's a huge honor, and I'm very humbled and feel very privileged to be sharing this space with such inspiring individuals and listening to you speak yesterday. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, but let's start with the basic stuff. Who are we and why are we here? Cyber Hospitality is a non-profit organization that creates pop-up hospitality training schools around the world, from Namibia to Mexico and Ohio to London. We work with marginalized individuals, those who have suffered from homelessness, incarceration, displacement, trauma, and long-term unemployment. We are passionate about training applicants of any age, from anywhere, and we place these wonderful individuals into full-time employment within the hospitality industry. Our pop-up schools help hospitality employers rethink the industry's outdated hiring practices by focus focusing on the training and employment of overlooked communities. We place education, community diplomacy, and social mobility at the core of our mission. Now, since bringing our work to London in 2022, we've seen a huge increase in refugee applicants to our schools and adapted our award-winning training programs to accommodate these resilient and inspiring people, supporting their entry to work in a sustainable and meaningful way for the foreseeable future. Currently, Syra are working with a contingent of rough sleepers, and sadly, more than 80% of these individuals are National Asylum Support Service leavers, patiently waiting to be registered for the private rented sector. Our solution not only provides employment, but connections to the ancillary services that shape the lives of these individuals. So let's take a step back and look at our, our mission, how we do what we do and why. In a number of steps, our mission is simple yet profound. Step one, in each destination we land in, we partner with local hospitality businesses who utilize their hiring and ESG budgets to fund our pop-up schools. For example, in London, we work with everyone from Claridge's and Belmond to Travel Lodge, Hilton, and everyone in between many of whom offer live-in accommodation for their employees and pay London living wage or above and provide internal progression training. 
Step two, we then partner with tens to hundreds of local NGOs, non-profits and charities who refer these marginalised individuals to our programmes in the locality. Step three, we train these individuals via our award-winning curriculum, which focuses on life skills such as communication, emotional intelligence, leadership and customer service. We provide free access to L2 qualifications, online training in hospitality technology software and anti-CV creation. More on that later. Through our partnership with Cornell University, we provide each student with a certificate, which is recognised worldwide as a hospitality qualification. Step four, during this training, we arrange workshops, guest speaker sessions and real-world experiences to prepare our candidates for success within the industry. We take our candidates to London's finest dining establishments to break down the walls of accessibility and encourage their appetite to become a part of providing outstanding guest experiences. Step five, after the school, the hospitality partners that funded the programme offer guaranteed job interviews for all graduates. Step six, post-graduation, Syrah's true asset kicks in, our everlasting and ongoing support for individuals. We offer comprehensive aftercare support tailored to our students' individual needs, including links to housing, transportation, counselling and career guidance. And this is thanks to our long-standing relationships with global champions of talent and support networks, like our good friends here today, Breaking Barriers. We work with only a pavement away, St Mungo's, The Big Issue, Crisis, the NHS, Job Centre. I could go on. There's so many more. Our goal is to not only equip these individuals with the skills they need to succeed, but also to ensure their safety and well-being throughout their journey into employment and everything that goes with it. Now, looking at the hospitality industry at large, more than ever, it faces significant challenges, especially post-Brexit and amid the lingering effects of the pandemic. Restaurants and hotels struggle to find qualified staff, leading to instability and a decline in service quality. By tapping into marginalised talent pools, we at Syrah can address the industry staffing shortages while providing life-changing opportunities to those in need. We believe that diversity and inclusion are not just buzzwords, but essential components of a thriving hospitality sector. We work on the culture fit. We work on the knowledge gap provision to ensure that these aren't just jobs. It isn't just work. It's a meaningful career for those that want to engage in a dynamic environment, to engage in a team, to learn English, to serve face to face. We're not focusing on hospitality purely due to these staff shortages. This is an ever-changing and globally essential industry, like what we're all experiencing here today and last night. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. We focus on the value of human interaction, on creating lasting memories and experiences in hospitality. It's an industry where people can genuinely change each other's lives. Looking at scalability, Syrah is a global operation. There is not a supply and demand issue here. We know there are thousands of people looking for work. And at Syrah, we know how to connect them to the right places, the right support, and the right jobs. Our scalability is demonstrated by our global reach, our ability to mobilize not only local trainers, but local project managers on the ground, local students from those communities, and local hotel partners. Our impact to date, 418 marginalized individuals have graduated from our programs with an overall employment rate of 70% and an annual turnover of just 10%. I don't know whether anyone here in the audience knows the global annual turnover. Okay, it's about 70 to 80%, all right? So with Syra, that is a minimum 60% improvement. Our impact upon the industry and the potential positive changes we can make together are absolutely colossal. Now, the problem, we have proven success, but gaining funding from hospitality businesses with so many black swan events in the world, it's never been harder. And this is where you folks come in. Now, this is the Dragon's Den moment, so just bear with, okay. Uh, we are seeking an investment of 300,000 pounds per year over the next five years, which will enable us to sustain our quarterly schools and our operations in London, whilst we build a for-profit subsidiary, which will help us scale our business model, reaching farther afield, providing essential training to those most in need of employment, most in need of those connections, and a sustainable future. In conclusion, Syrah Hospitality is more than just a training programme. It is a movement, a movement towards inclusivity, opportunity, and social impact. Together, we can empower lives, transform communities, and build a brighter future for all. Thank you so much for your consideration and support. <laughs>